were unable to be here today. So just to keep in mind that this is not a private event. And number two, since we do have guests joining us today, we should be mindful of how we use acronyms that people from outside of the school will not be so familiar with. So that's pretty much it. To start us off, I just wanna share the mission of Impact at CIS. It is a student group that offers CIS students with support on impact-oriented projects while creating a space that nurtures integral leadership and creativity in order to build and sustain a community that thrives on transdisciplinary change making. Our three pillars are salon gatherings, speaker series, and workshop events. So if any of you are interested in joining the integral entrepreneurship movement, this is the place for you. Aye, would you like to share a few words about PCC Forum? You're muted, Aye. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know I was muted too. Uh, I'm Aya Kashani. I am co-leading the PCC Forum with Matt Switzer. The Philosophy, Cosmology and Consciousness Forum or the PCC Forum is a student-held transdisciplinary lecture series held by the Philosophy, Cosmology and Consciousness Program here at CIS. The forum provides a space for both PhD students and master's students to share and refine their research with the community. And uh, we also hold host presentations by faculty members, by alumni, as well as thinkers, artists, and other creatives outside of the institution. Holding to the ideal of a philosophical community, the forum is a ritual event intended to foster dialogue and strongly encourages contributions from across all programs at CIS. Gripped by the conviction that knowledge is a communal achievement, we aspire to make time and space for mutual enrichment and a diversification of thought. So we are very excited to be working with IMPACT at CIS this semester and hope to grow the events into a more interdisciplinary array. Uh, Carrie, I'll give it to you. Thanks, Aya. I'm just gonna share my screen real quick so we can introduce our speakers. So and you might want to put your view on speaker view if uh, the participants are taking up part of the screen. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Carrie Vasquez. I am in the PCC, Conscious, uh, which is Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness doctoral program here at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And it's an absolute honor to introduce our speakers today from Planet Drum Foundation and the Terran Collective, as I deeply respect each of their unique approaches to bioregionalism. Judy Goldhaft is joining us from the Planet Drum Foundation, which was founded in 1973 to promote and encourage ecologically sustainable living founded on an understanding of one's bioregion. For nearly 50 years, Planet Drum has sought to enhance the intimate connection with life places by spreading the ideas and activities of living in place. Through over 50 publications, hundreds of workshops, formal curricula, even theater, and hands-on demonstration projects. This work is motivated by their vision of a truly sustainable world in which humans are harmonious with, with and respectful of their natural environment. Claire Politano and Neha Sharma are joining us from the Terran Collective, which is a community committed to the necessary work of healing and transformation so that all beings in our bioregion have what they need to thrive. They are building systems and tools that foster trust and collaboration and they focus on five areas of practice, including community weaving, technology for thriving, regenerating the commons, collaborative ecosystem mapping, and finally, storytelling for cultural evolution. They are stewarding the development of a collaboration platform called HILO that helps people coordinate across networks and communities on shared goals. And we hope that you can all walk away from this talk today with a better understanding of bioregionalism its historical context and modern applications, as well as a newfound sense of wonder and curiosity for the places in which you live. And hopefully even you'll be inspired to participate in the ne necessary regeneration work that needs to happen in place by contributing your own beautiful gifts. And now with that, I'll turn it over to Judy. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. I'm really delighted to, that I was invited to share with you a quick overview of Planet Drum Foundation. 
I'd like to start with the word bioregion, which you seem to be all familiar with, but let's go over it one more time. It's bio for life, region for place. So a bioregion is a life place. And every bioregion has particular areas, uh, uh, particular animals and plants, uh, soils, uh, a whole web of life that is particular to the bioregion. And um, all, all of these things make up the web of life of a bioregion. And then the question becomes how do human beings fit into the bioregion? Well, actually, we feel that people are part of the web of life and um, that they don't control their ecosystem, that they don't use up its resources, um, that they, but some of them might be unaware of their bioregion. And if you're unaware of your bioregion or your life place, then it's very likely that you'll probably do things that are damaging to it. We're supported by the place and we support the place. <clears throat> This is how humans have lived for the longest time on earth in an equilibrium with their places. And um, we would like, this is not something new. This is actually quite old. It, it's very simple, but it's also has many ramifications that are really complicated. And we've lived this way about 300 years ago. Um, people got very excited and they sort of forgot about this aspect of um, connection. It's because they had found a new planet. It was called the new world and it seemed to be filled with uh, resources that were just there for the taking. But the reality is that we're supported by the place and the pla we need to become uh, support and we need to support the place as well. It's become very obvious that this is important in the last 50 years, as, as you all know. Um, so let's go to 19, in 1967, Peter Berg recognized this reality and he wrote about it in a, a manifesto called Trip Without a Ticket, which envisioned environmental consciousness as a, as a new basis for social change. It was the first time that some people had ever heard the word ecology. Ecology was a new word to a lot of people. In 1973, Peter founded Planetrum Foundation to develop a place-located ecological ph philosophy and a movement to restore bioregions that could eventually replace the disinhabitory view of industrialism. And that remains the goal of Planet Drum even today. Planet Drum's mission statement is to promote and encourage ecologically sustainable living founded on an understanding of one's bioregion, a geographic area of interconnected natural systems and their characteristics. And Planet Drum is known as an innovative voice for bioregional sustainability education and culture. You know, in 1973, the word bioregion was a new tricky kind of term. It actually was a 19th century biological sciences word, and Peter added um, humans into it. So let's look at it again. This is an early description of a bioregion. It's a distinct area with coherent and interconnected plant and animal communities and natural systems, often defined by a watershed, and the cultural values that human residents have developed from living in harmony with these natural systems. It's a whole system with unique requirements for human inhabitation, so it won't be disrupted or injured. Because it includes human cultural elements, you define a bioregion with information from both sciences and other sources. 
And Peter explained that there are three main uh, goals of bioregionalism. Um, could we switch? Yes. You can see it's uh, restoring and sustainability um, and supporting the work of re-inhabitation, which is uh, um, uh, inhabitation. It's uh, becoming native to the place again. And uh, it actually means discovering culturally appropriate activities in your bioregion. For example, the kind of alternative energy that works in your bioregion. Or perhaps you would not want to plant a grass lawn if you live in the desert. And maybe you would even want to have celebrations uh, that, that talk about the migrations that maybe a, um, a celebration of return of the Salmon Day. You know, that's what um, May Day was actually a recognition of the red deer migrations in Europe. We still use May Day today. So I, I want to remind you also that this is the way First Peoples lived for thousands of years. And we're just trying to make it part of our lives again. A bioregional identity addresses community, biodiversity, indigenous and environmental questions. It's a post-industrial identity a future primitive identity. It reconsiders basic cultural questions. Peter put it this way, it represents an eco-cultural transition. This is a big shift. It's a new perception of human identity. Who are you? Where are you? What are you going to do about it? So, in order to help people answer those questions and become active with bioregional ideas, um, we did, Planet Drum did workshops. We did workshops um, that were mapping workshops, and that was to, to locate where you are. The, wor the workshops became um, uh, were put together in a book called Discovering Your Life Place. And the workshops were deceptively simple. They asked, they had you locate where you are, and then they had you um, put people into it, the good and the bad things that people are doing in your bioregion, and also the things that um, the way that you could work together. So that answered the question of what are you going to do about it? They were kind of community empowerment workshops. So now let's look at a few maps because some bioregions, you can see the outlines of some bioregions um, on physiographic maps, which is what this is. As you can see, California has this lovely bowl in the middle of it, and to the west of it, to the east of it, um, is the Great Basin, which is shown as a dry area, and south of this bowl is also the desert. It's actually the an edge of the Mexican, uh, northern Mexican desert. S oops. <laughs> so now, now let's let look at it from a bioregional point of view. A lot of bioregional maps were made uh, to identify where people were and also as flags for the bioregion. This, uh, this bioregional map, half of it's water. And the reason that half of it's water is because water has such an impressive, important uh, influence on the weather in California, in Northern California. We're looking at Northern California you can notice that the Great Basin East part and the South part, they're gone. They're not part of it. Um, and actually it goes up a little higher into Oregon. But, uh, and if you notice at the very top, there's a coyote, a little coyote, because he, coyote is one of the totem species of Northern California. 
the water that's along the coast in Northern California is quite cold. It's because we're part of the North Pacific Basin and the water comes all the way from um, Japan. It's the Kurosiwu, the Japanese current. So let's look at another map. This is an urban map that was made. It's a bioregional map. And you can see the physiographic part of it is on the left and the more contemporary cityscape is on the right. And this map was, has been used educationally quite, quite a lot. Lots of groups have used it, lots of schools have used it. The thing that I love about it is that if you only look at the physiographic part of it, can you locate where you live? Can you do it without the streets? You have to look back and forth. It's kind of fun. Let's look at one more map. This is a bioregional map that came from Italy and it's the watershed map of the Po River Valley. Um, it's the, in the shape of an oak leaf because in fact they take the oak as one of their totem species. And the, the leaves at the top are the Alps and Milan is on the left and Venice is on the right and there's the whole bio, bio regional. They use this as a flag actually. They use this quite a lot. So um, let's see, I'd like to share a few things, excuse me, a few things that Planet Drum has done. One of, <clears throat> one of the things we did was we um, facilitated a bioregional study group that looked at re-inhabitory, how one could re-inhabitory, re-inhabit the, um, the Bay Area. And as every, that group got together once a week and had an expert come in and talk to them about the Bay Area. And they ended up making the map that's on the right which is actually a gull's eye view of um, Northern California. Notice there's a little gull down at the bottom of it. And um, they, it, it's called the Watershed Guide and it was put together and the results of all the study group they did, they put into a little book that talked about living here. And I'd actually like to read to you the introduction to living here. It's called born, born is meaning carried, born native in the San Francisco Bay region. We who live around the San Francisco Bay, Sacramento River estuary, all species ranging this watershed on the North Pacific Rim, feel a common resonance behind the quick beats of our separate lives long pulse rhythms of the region pronouncing itself through winter wet and summer dry, something flowering anytime, cool fog, tremor and slide. The region proclaims itself clearly. So that, one, one of the other, um, some of the other things that Planet Drum has done is we helped produce Shasta Bioregional Gatherings in which urban and rural activists who were uh, involved in thinking about their life places sustainably, uh, a really incredibly diverse group of people got together and um, had workshops and watershed reports and shared music and food. And if you notice the logo for the Shasta Bioregional Gathering ha is surrounded by endemic species to Northern California. And then recognizing that urban areas were the largest, um, greatest drain on the bioregion's resources, we decided to hold nine Green City Symposia uh, on Urban Sustainability. And 
the proceedings from the symposia uh, actually presented in a very accessible way were put together in the book, A Green City Program for the San Francisco Bay Area and Beyond. And we distributed it to um, city councils all over, all over North America, actually. And um, it actually was the impetus for the San Francisco uh, City Council to create the Department of the Environment. So um, Carrie had asked me to, to tell you a little bit about where Planet Drum is from, where it came from. And I've already mentioned um, that uh, Peter had, was thinking along these lines in 1967. But let's, so let's skip ahead to the 1970s. So in the 1970s, many young people had fled the cities to go and explore post-industrial lifestyles living out in the countryside. They were called the back to the landers. And um, Peter and I traveled with uh, a video camera and went and to go and visit these people and see what they were doing, what they were discovering. And Peter helped them make video postcards. So we would go to one group and then we would go to the next group and you, they would, we would be connecting these people and they would get to know each other. And everywhere, wh what was quite amazing not really amazing, but kind of surprising, was that every place that we went, no matter how far off the, uh, the highways, no matter down a dirt road, the back back, that's where we were going, every place was involved next door to an ecological disaster. They were happening everywhere. And um, so there were toxic wastes, there were clear cutting forests, there were plants to construct nuclear power plants, the streams were bubbling with one that has no idea of what. And um, I want to mention that as part of this traveling, we traveled all around North America. We ended up spending the winter in Maine. And uh, before we came back, Peter went to the first UN conference on the environment, uh, at, which was held in Stockholm. Someone sent him a ticket to go and he went. And there, while he was there, he ran into um, the people that were not allowed into the conference. There were thousands of them and they were in the street and they were all concerned with ecological problems in their places. Peter, Peter named them the planetaria. In any case, when we finally made it back to California several years later, um, we, um, we saw, that's when Planet Drum started. That's how it was. We had made all these connections to all these people and we wanted to keep the connections up. Kind of, we were kind of the internet. We were physically connecting, net networking with all these people. And we wanted to keep in touch with them all. And we began doing publications and uh, we started Planet Drum at that time. And Planet Drum has continued to do publications. and. Um, I'd like to, uh, to share some of the, the ways that people have gotten involved with Planet Drum and bioregionalism. So we're going to make bioregion a verb. So rather than it being a noun, a place, we were involved with ways to bioregion. And many people have, um, have found many ways to do this. Uh, and the term bioregion is not necessary to, to um, be doing things that are striving to enhance the, uh, our life in the biosphere. Um, I, I think that we have a list, uh, 
uh, some of the logos of organizations that are doing what Planet Drum tends to call things that really work. So these are some places around here. You may or may not know about them. And there are actually some places that use the name bioregion in their, uh, in their name, their bioregional groups. So this kind of work continues and uh, perhaps you would like to get involved with Planet Drum and doing some of them. And you're, if anything strikes you, just get in touch with us. Our email is there. You can help Planet Drum. So I'd like to leave you with um, uh, some quotes that are the ways that people muse about bioregions. They're quite diverse. They're quite different. They're kind of fun. And also, I'd like you to leave you with a, an inspirational photo, kind of a jokey photo that someone made because our office was graffitied. And now, if everybody would please turn off their mute button. Can you turn off your mute buttons? Because I'd like to, for all of us, to give a coyote howl in, in solidarity with our species here in Northern California in Shasta Bayou region. So you have your you have your mute button off? I do. Ready? Here we go. to do a little exercise next. We want to have a participatory, participatory exercise between the speakers. Um, but first, I just want to thank Judy for um, her great presentation. I hope you get a sense of all the tremendous work that Planet Drum has done over the years um, and the contributions that they've made. Even if you've never heard of bioregion, bioregionalism or Planet Drum, you've probably met people who have been touched by this in various ways. So thank you, Judy. And now I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to take us through a little interactive exercise. And I'll share my screen again for you, Matt. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much. And thank you so much, Judy. Um, I, I had a good fortune of working with Judy for a couple of years um, and uh, learned everything, uh, not everything at all, um, but a lot about bioregionalism, um, which um, just made a huge impact on me, so I thank you very much. Um, and I would highly recommend checking out the website, um, some of the videos and, and a lot of the resources that Planet Drum Foundation has um, are amazing uh, in terms of the bioregional primary sources, et cetera. So check those out. Um, <clears throat> so I'm an educator. Uh, I teach middle school social studies, um, and we are kind of struggling to try to figure out uh, in this age of uh, COVID, kind of how uh, we need to rethink education. Um, so one of the things that we're doing um, is we're really looking at this bioregional quiz as uh, a kind of rethinking of what, what actually matters in, uh, in education. So what I'd like uh, you all to do, if you could, I'd like you to go through each of these questions. Uh, maybe we'll take a minute or two just to sort of be silent. Um, and as you're reading through these, I'd love for you to just kind of be mindful of uh, what is coming up for you, uh, what these questions bring up for you. Um, and I believe Carrie has uh, allowed for the chats to occur. So you are welcome to uh, share your score, or if you do not want to share your score, that is totally understandable. Um, but if you could maybe share a word or two or a phrase uh, that sort of encapsulates what, um, what this brings up for you, um, we can maybe have a little go around uh, after and, um, and see what you all think. So take a minute, read through these, and uh, feel free to 
chat anything in the um, chat about what's going on for you. And then just a clarification point that it's it's one point for each correct answer and the scoring key is on the right. It should take you about uh, two to three minutes or so. All right, and as we come to the end, I just uh, invite you to uh, consider some questions. Um, but why are these Why are these questions important? Um, and how would it How would it change how you live uh, if you knew the answers to these questions? Um, what would our world look like if these were the questions that young people were asked on their quizzes or their tests um, at the end of the year? Um, and then any anything else that uh, comes up for you, uh, either feel free to uh, to share it um, in the chat, or if you'd like to raise your hand and uh, share here, that is um, wonderful too. And Judy, maybe what would be interesting, I don't know if you're, you know the answer to this, but I'd be curious kind of how this, um, I can see it's sort of adapted from Coevolution Quarterly, but I'm curious how this quiz came to be, if you have any insight into that. Well, yes, I know how it came to be. Um, Peter, Peter Berg and Stephanie Mills co-edited um, an issue of Coevolution Quarterly magazine. Um, and they asked, they asked Jim, or Jim suggested he wanted to do it. I don't know, but that's what it, that's what it was made for. It's been, it's been modified and reprinted many, many times. And I never get a very good, a very high score on it. Um, but I think it tells you what you don't know. Absolutely. Um, and I think, Carrie, I think you sent me like five different bioregional quizzes. So constant reiterations, right? Uh, constantly sort of rethinking, you know, what are the top 20 questions that are important to know in the area? Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you who are asking, you know, what is, what are the right answers? Judy, how would you, uh, <laughs> how would you respond to that? What are the right answers? I don't know. You have to find them yourself, you know, um, the discovering your life place, which is this mapping workshop. We got a response from a college professor who had ordered it saying the answers aren't in the back. <laughs> I think that's the same, the same thing. It's, this is, this is an outline for a year long study group, I think. I think so. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, very much, Judy. Um, and thank you, everybody. Feel free to continue uh, putting in your scores or, or throwing out any thoughts. Um, but I'm going to give it back to Carrie, who I think is going to introduce the next speaker. I just want to say thank you again for having me here. It's, this is being fun. Zooming around. I'm zooming. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Carrie. We're so happy to have you, Judy, and uh, we're so happy to have our next speakers join us from the Terran Collective. I believe Claire is going to share her screen with some slides and take it from here. Thank you. All right, amazing. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you so much, Judy. It's wonderful to hear your wisdom. 
We're very lucky. All right, can you see my screen? Cool, Neha, take it away. Amazing. Um, and just to echo Claire, it's such an honor to be here and to discuss a topic that is so near and dear um, to I think many of us and to be in service to this movement. Um, so thank you, Judy, for sharing your wisdom and Carrie and Matt for coordinating this. Um, Claire and I are here from Terran Collective and um, we're going to share a little bit about who we are and what we're focusing on and how this might all relate. Um, so Terran Collective is a community of care and practice and we are building systems and tools for a regenerative future. We are five stewards um, from a wide variety of backgrounds, activists, permaculturists, system transformers, designers, artists, and we are dedicated to amplifying cooperation amongst those working to regenerate our communities and planet. And we do this all while taking a bioregional approach. So five of the areas of practice that we focus on um, are here on this slide. So I'll share a little bit more about what these mean to us and also our deepest inquiries uh, for all of these. So when it comes to regenerating the commons, we're thinking about how to rebuild our ability to collectively govern the commons. And we do this by experimenting with decentralized models, gift economies, and our inquiry here is how do we return to remembered ways of working together? Um, how do we steward a commons and how do we have a common pool of resources? We also do community weaving. Um, we believe that strong communities can develop resist resilience against rapid change. We can practice solidarity and equity and work to heal and regenerate the land we live on together. And I think now is a really exemplary time of communities who have been exercising their resilience muscles um, for a while, and also highlighting why it is so important to have resilient communities. And our inquiry here is how do we build bridges across diverse communities to ensure that every voice has a seat at the table? Um, we also focus on mapping the ecosystem. So this refers to not only mapping uh, resources, but mapping our watershed, understanding our relationship to nature um, in that way. And there are all different types of resource flows that are happening all around us. So um, how can we transparently map these resources and relationships across a bioregion so that we generate stronger bonds, accountability, and accelerate regeneration. Um, we also focus on storytelling for cultural evolution. Uh, and, and this one's a lot of fun. Um, how can we shift cultural narratives and share our story in a new way that resonates with all different types of populations and communities? And here we sit with the question, how can we share stories that are inclusive, inspiring, and unifying at the same time. Um, it's really easy to feel overwhelmed and distracted by the amount of disaster happening around us. And so to ground us and unify in a vision that is beautiful, um, is, it's, it's an art. Uh, and then there are many different ways to tell those stories. And I think Planet Drum does a really beautiful job of doing that. Uh, and then there's also technology for thriving. So how do we build systems and tools to allow us to coordinate at scale? Um, how can we do collective sense making, collaborative decision making that most importantly result in offline impact? So there isn't necessarily a desire to have more screen time for the sake of screen time, but how can we have our screen time be uh, in service to our hands and soil and to us gathering together in person. Um, and we'll share a little bit more on that one. Um, but this is all centered around the, the mission that we were sharing a little bit earlier, which gets to a little bit about of our, our theory of change. 
So we feel strongly about fostering relationships of trust within ourselves, with each other, and with the land. And in order to do that, that means having a place to really feel strong and have um, a space where individuals can really act in accordance to their deepest purpose. Uh, ikigai, if you're familiar with that terminology. Um, and once we are strong within ourselves, we can participate in healthy rela relationships of mutual support and empowerment. And that will allow us to further collaborate, um, which then allows us to weave a little bit more and deeply. And that allows us to cooperate in action. Um, and returning to this theory of change is really important to us and, and ensuring that we are acting within our individual purpose, within the group purpose, and so that you can have um, thriving bioregions that will result in a thriving biosphere. And so if these relationships exist, then we can coordinate in action at the scale of the bioregion. And bioregional coordination is, as Judy mentioned, not necessarily novel. Uh, this has been happening longer than we even know. And there are several tools that allow us to coordinate at the bioregional level. There are gatherings, amazing articles and newsletters, theater, maps, film, plays. And um, uh, he, what you can see here are some pictures that, that Judy might recognize. Uh, my favorite is um, with the SF Mime Troupe in DeBoes Park, uh, also working on some maps, just workshops. And we see this happening today with folks like Extinction Rebellion who are putting together these th theatrical protests. And um, there are so many different ways and it's a really holistic way to coordinate at the bioregional level. And I love the way that um, the ways to bioregion comes together. And today we also have an additional tool and that tool is technology. So how do we support all of these different tools and create an additional tool in a good way? that allows us to continue to relate to maps, that allows us to gather in person, that allows us to find the answers and feel empowered to go outside and know what the, the answers are for the bioregional quiz. Um, how can we be in service to that mission? And as we were exploring different ways of coordinating with each other, we really were looking for a tool that had the integrity and the values that would allow us to be able to do that. And we couldn't find anything that really matched the level of, um, I think, sophistication and the necessary ethics to really be in right relationship with land and with each other. So we um, are creating a coordination tool and the values and principles that will be a part of that are laid out here. And we like to say that these principles are a part of everything that we do. When we think about community weaving and regenerating the commons, what are the principles that we can come back to that we know will outlive um, us? So seven generation thinking is a big part of that. How do we build tools that are needed for the long-term success of the planet, relationship-centered design, working in deep partnership with all stakeholders, data interoperability, so using open standards and protocols where we can, privacy and user sovereignty, uh, because it's very important for us to know where our information is going and what's happening with it and what we can do with it inclusivity so that these tools can work for all different types of communities, transparency in operations, decision making, governance, and cooperative ownership. So how can we transition to a cooperative so that all users benefit from this type of system? 
And this lands us in the social coordination platform for a thriving planet that Claire will tell us a little bit more about. Yay, thank you, Neha. Um, that was really beautiful. So these principles that Neha just shared, we apply them to everything that we do at Terran Collective. Um, but particularly when it comes to technology that we build. And of course, technology is not just zeros and ones. Technology is how we relate to each other. It's our, um, our ways of being in relationship, our ways of sharing our resources. And it's the tools that we use. And uh, Neha shared a, a beautiful history of the kinds of tools that have been used to develop bioregional understanding uh, historically. And of course, um, in this day and age, one of those tools is um, online tools, um, online technology. And that is one of the places where we really do our work. And uh, it's very interesting because the kind of technology that we envision does not really exist yet. Um, most of what the internet is made out of is dedicated to uh, optimizing profit and selling things. Um, and that's, that's the economic engine that makes resources on the internet available. Um, and as a result, we have all of the social networks that we have are dedicated to selling us things, advertising to us, um, maximizing for the time that we spend on the platform. So they're taking our attention. And in some cases, actively optimizing for Discord so that we are more, uh, more wrapped up in it. And trying to use platforms like that to coordinate, to do something good in the world, it's just um, to not very effective. It's very difficult to do. And we just don't believe that the future that works for all is going to be built through coordination on these platforms. So what can we have instead? Um, what if we actually had online tools that bring us together, that help us build relationships offline, that strengthen those relationships and help us trust each other more and bring us into better relationship with the land we live on? Um, what if we could use technology that helped us build strong enough relationships to collaborate on projects that actually have ecological impact, helping the land we live on, or social impact, helping our communities. This is a thing that can really happen. Um, but like Neha said, we didn't see really this, we didn't see any existing platforms that did this. Um, and this being the Bay Area and us being technologists, we decided to build this. Um, and so the way that we are doing this is with a platform called Hilo. And the brief history of Hilo is that it exists today as a really lovely collaboration platform that a team of very nice humans were working on for about five years and originally funded with venture capital. Um, and they saw it as a social, a social network, a social collaboration tool that um, would help in a different way, that would help people collaborate across networks. And through a very auspicious and beautiful partnership, um, the founders of Hilo were able to sell it to Holo, the makers of the decentralized internet platform Holochain, who wanted basically to use the code for parts. And they used the front end code for a community app on Holochain, and then they open sourced it and they formed a partnership with us where they are giving us stewardship of Hilo um, in perpetuity to do what we want with it, to take care of all the users that are on the platform currently. There's about 1500 active users currently and many, many communities that have been using it for years. And so the reason that we wanted this beautiful gift is that it's a really well-built app um, the values were pretty aligned from the beginning, other than being a for-profit enterprise. And it is the perfect substrate for us to keep building on and to keep building the things and the tools that we know that we need 
to do this work in the world. Things that no for-profit company is ever gonna do. Things like collective governance tools so that we can vote for things amongst ourselves and make decisions as a group, any group that we define. Or financial coordination tools so that we can pool our money and vote on where we use it and send it to different projects in our bio region. Um, so I'll get into some of the features in a minute, but just to say that's a little bit of the genesis of how we came to be working on Hilo. And we've only had stewardship of it for about six months and have already implemented a lot of really cool things like the map, which you'll see an example of in just a minute. Um, so what do we think Hilo is going to do or what's different about this compared to Facebook or Slack or whatever tool you might use? Um, from the beginning, the architecture of Hilo has been designed to help people coordinate, not just within their own silo, but across many different communities. So a participant in Hilo can be a member of 10 communities, 100 communities, and when you make a post, you can share it to all of them, and a conversation can happen that is shared across communities. And that means collaboration can happen across communities. This is really unique, and we don't see it anywhere else on any kind of coordination platform. And the reason it's important is because we have a really big task ahead of us to regenerate not only the land we live on in our bioregions, but the entire planet. We need to regenerate this planet so that we can steward it responsibly so that all beings can thrive. And that's not something that any one person can do alone. <laughs> it's not something that any one community can do alone. It's something that an amazing patchwork of people all around the world are gonna to do together. And we need to be able to coordinate across state lines, across political boundaries, across continents, to coordinate to achieve shared goals. And in order to coordinate at that scale, we really need a digital tool that can help us do this. So that is what we are building Hilo to be. Um, all right, so some words about where we're going with this platform. Uh, we are busting it open. Um, <laughs> up until now, Hilo communities have been invite only, just like a Slack group. Um, but we are, we, we built a public map and now you can go on there and find any community. And if they're open to people joining them, you can join it, which is really cool. Um, posts can be made public. So anyone can find them if you're if you're if you're feeling safe and resource to share in that way you can and that helps people find things going on in their own communities that they might not have even known about um, so it's global directory is in progress right now um, as well as uh, there's so much to touch on um, with a whole on architecture all right so a whole on is a whole part of a whole part of the whole it recognizes that the universe is made up of holes and res restoration at any level, any level of this fractal understanding of reality um, will result in healing at all the levels. And to do all the healing that needs to be done to restore this planet, healing at any level is going to help. And so we call our architecture holonic when it comes to the organization of the groups. So a community can be part of a network on Hilo and collaborate with the other communities within that network. And we're gonna add on to that by building a level above the network, which is a movement. So, and also a level smaller than a community, which is a group. And so people can gather in these scales as is appropriate to their task at hand, and then they can coordinate across those scales. Um, so there's some work to do to make that architecture real. Um, yeah, so much to say. Um, mostly, uh, I guess I just want to touch on tools for bioregional coordination is ultimately where we're going with this. And that means that people need to be able to build relationships, as Neha touched on in our theory of change, right? We need to build stronger relationships. We need to be able to trust each other because only if we have those things are we going to be able to collaborate effectively offline in the real world. And we need to understand the land that we live on. That bioregional quiz is no joke. To be able to steward the land that owns us, 
we need to understand it so that we can care for it. And so being able to map not only, you know, my, my own resources or my own asks or offers, um, I want to map the migratory bird habitat in my bioregion. I want to map where I find the native grasses. I want to map places of interest, uh, maybe places that are pollution, sites of pollution that need to be remediated. Um, all of these things. And then by looking at this map that we're building together, we're going to build bioregional intelligence. And then by adding collective governance tools onto that, we can make decisions together on how we're going to handle these things. Um, so that's that's where we're going. Um, so here's some screenshots. Um, this is the map. Uh, this is the public map of the Bay Area right now. This is a very new feature, so there's not a lot here yet. Um, but these are posts that people have chosen to make public. Um, and yeah, that's just a really cool thing um, to be able to see what's going on in your area. And this is kind of the landing view that you would have coming into Hilo. Um, so there's a stream view in the middle, which is a pretty familiar architecture. And there, the main posts that can happen are discussions, requests, offers, and resources, um, as well as projects and events. And people can share whatever they have to share with their community. And there's commenting, we have private messaging and group messaging, um, and uh, member directories so you can see who's in your community. So all, a lot of the familiar features of a social platform um, is what is currently in Hilo. And then we have a lot that we're gonna build on top of it. And oh yeah, one more screenshot, um, just the primary interface of what it's like to share a post. So you can choose which communities your post will go into. You can tag it with topics, and then the topics are like conversations that can be followed across the community or even publicly. Um, I can choose to make it public, I can set a time frame, I can set a location, which is how it gets on the map. So this is what we're working with so far. And yeah, so far it's a great social collaboration app and where we're going, uh, we are really excited about. But it's not just the features, it's also how we're doing this. Um, and doing, building technology differently is really critical. So two of the buckets that our approach fits into are a multi-stakeholder approach and a tech commons. We're building Hilo to be a tech commons. Um, so when we decide what to build, this isn't just our decision alone because we really see Hilo as a public resource, a public utility even, or a tech commons. Uh, we're building this for everyone and we are the stewards of this open source project but and that means that we're not the owners and anyone that wants to participate in this is invited everyone is welcome and we're building this for the good of all um, so we need to be speaking with everyone and understanding the needs of the people in our communities so that we're not just building this thing for people, we're building it with you, with everyone that wants to be a part of creating a world that works for all. So um, some of the people that we speak to, to, to ideate on the features that we develop, um, community leaders, people that are doing the regeneration work on the ground, um, including, uh, right now we're talking with local indigenous leaders, which has been super illuminating when it comes to how we make a map that is responsible and um, respectful of the sacredness of the land. Um, so yeah, talking to community leaders who have had their community on Hilo for a long time, talking with partners that, um, that wanna use Hilo and bringing them all to the table and having conversations about a feature set, like what do we need this map to do? What do we need, um, what do we need voting to be like? What is the experience that your community needs to have to achieve its goals? Um, and then with the tech commons, this is, again, this is a thing that's owned by all, it's for the public good. And it's open source, that means the code is public, it is on GitHub and anyone can look at it and download it and use it. You could put, put your own version of it on your own server if you wanted to. You can do whatever you want. Uh, and you can participate in it, you can submit code improvements too. Um, 
and it's free to use. It's always going to be free. We want to offer it to the community as a gift because it was given to us as a gift. And we want to make it interoperable with other platforms. So we're not trying to create another silo here. We want to break down the silos and cut the fences. And uh, that means collaborating with other collaboration platforms <laughs> and working together so that our data can be flowing across these channels and participants can use their data however they want. That user sovereignty is really, really critical. Uh, yeah, so um, some more thoughts. Uh, this is an experiment. We don't have all the answers. Um, this is sort of a, a research effort is one way to look at it. Uh, we are planning to learn a lot. <laughs> and the flow that we've identified is we have these co-creation sessions with these stakeholders. And then we design features, we build the features. And what we'd like to do with our communities that we're in partnership with is test with them, really understand whether this platform is helping communities achieve their goals. For example, are more relationships forming? Are they deepening? Are more projects starting with more people collaborating on them through Hilo? And ultimately, it would be amazing to be able to track the offline impact. Um, maybe one day we will actually be able to measure the carbon that's sequestered as a result of collaborations that started on Hilo. That's where we want to go with this. Um, and so the cycle will complete. We'll get feedback from our users. Uh, we'll analyze all these metrics for success and calibrate accordingly so that we're constantly adjusting course to make sure that we're serving everyone. And yeah, so what's it all for? Like, how is this going to unite a bio region? Uh, we have a lot of use cases that we would love to see on the platform. So for one thing, you can look at the map and find things that are happening in your region. That's really important. There's so many people who want to help and we want to help those people help by finding things that they can connect with. So that's really critical. Um, mutual aid networks is a thing that has um, come into the public view a lot more over the course of this past year. And we definitely want to be a place where mutual aid networks can flourish. Just helping each other day to day and then being able to spring into action when something really serious happens, like a fire. Um, so stewarding common resources, like a watershed. A watershed crosses political boundaries and resources like that are a little bit difficult to steward appropriately when we're divided in our polities. Um, but if we could coordinate based on the landscape that we share together, we might be more effective stewarding these things in the natural world. Yeah, and on that note, carrying capacity is a really important concept. So like the amount of a population of a species that the land can support. Uh, right now, most places that humans are, we're way over our carrying capacity, especially in the Bay Area. For example, San Francisco is certainly not supporting its own population when it comes to water and food produced on the peninsula. Um, but we don't really have visibility into that every day. But if we did, uh, we could try to adjust course and we could try to figure out, all right, how can this bioregion support the population here? What adjustments do we need to make? And coordinating to make those adjustments one day. Um, yeah, and ultimately, um, preserving the knowledge about this bioregion. So the seven generations, we like to say, don't just go forwards, um, they also go backwards. And we wanna honor and understand the knowledge that previous generations have gathered and held sacred about the land that we live on. Um, if that information were lost, that would make it much harder for us to be in right relationship with our land. Um, and we need new ways to preserve that information as the world moves online and into digital spaces. So being able to hold that in an online space is really important. Cool. So almost done, just end game, right? Like what is the ultimate goal here? Um, it's pretty ambitious, <laughs> but we want to unite the people of our bioregion, which is the Bay Area, um, 
we want to unite and improve this bioregion. We want to improve human communities. We want to promote ecological thriving here in this place, in the, in the land that we are on right now. And we want to identify the patterns that work here for bioregional regeneration that might be able to work elsewhere. Um, every bioregion is different. There's no one size fits all answer to this, but there might be patterns that can help. And if we learn about those patterns in the course of our work, we want to share them. Um, yeah, and ultimately, this is about a little bit of an evolution in our ability as people to coordinate in a way that we have not before. Um, being able to coordinate at the scale of an entire bioregion and make good stewardship decisions for the land that we all share and we all depend on together. Because this is a boundary that to us makes a lot more sense than arbitrary political lines. The boundary that's defined by nature, by the earth, um, that's the shared interest that we all rely on. So that should be the boundary, we believe, that um, that is a basis for organizing. And if we're able to organize one bioregion, we might be able to organize all of them. And maybe one day we can work together as a world of coherent bioregions that are capable of collaborating to regenerate the biosphere. Uh, yeah, it's a dream and it just might work. We'll see. Yeah, so um, that's all from us for today. Thank you for listening. Um, and here's some ways you can get in touch with us. Great. Thank you so much, Neha and Claire. Uh, I hope you all get a sense from this. I know technology brings up a lot of feelings and tensions and, and, and it's because of the way technology is done because platforms like Facebook are captured in this industrial extractive economy where um, they're forced to make a profit and so therefore they're forced to sell us things. Um, and um, even though that platform is incredibly useful, I hope you can see from this presentation that technology can be done in a different way, in a different way that helps us develop the commons, helps us govern the commons in these amazing peer-to-peer -peer networks. So um, at this point, we'd like to invite you all to ask questions. You can either do that through the chat, or if you prefer, you can raise your hand by going on the participants tab and then clicking um, raise hand. So at this point, we'll open it up for everyone to uh, ask questions. And thank you so much to our presenters so far. I have a question. Um, thank you so much, Neha and Claire. That was, that was really, really quite something. And I'm curious to know, uh, what are some major challenges that you guys are facing uh, with Hilo? Yeah, well, so many challenges. Um, this is a really difficult thing to do. So right now it's really um, a research phase and understanding what communities need, understanding what it takes to tell the story. So this was great practice, thank you. Um, how can we convey what is needed in an online tool in a way that will resonate with people? Um, and help people understand like why a platform like Facebook or Slack might not be enough for the work that we need to do. Um, so I'd say the storytelling piece is our biggest challenge to get right, right now. Um, and I'm sure Neha has thoughts on that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and what comes to mind for me is, uh, and I think this might hopefully resonate with everyone here in the virtual room, but we are trying to create the new while still existing in now. Um, so how do you create a new system when, ac when actually your reality is still tied to the old ways of being? And how do you be mindful of um, the old way of being, not uh, of it just creeping in? Um, it's so easy to think, oh, well, what does success mean for this? It's probably number of active users and this and that and all these like metrics that are designed to 
um, steal attention away from each other and ourselves and being outside. Um, so being mindful of why we are creating things, why we are making certain decisions, why must we sit with the really difficult questions of, um, you know, discussing with indigenous solidarity uh, leaders, how have maps affected their stories? How can we do this and not rush into something that will be ultimately harmful? Um, that's really, it's, it's a really delicate balance to both exist in today and try to think about seven generations from now um, while also honoring the seven generations that came prior because none of this is new. I mean, we can see from Judy's incredible presentation, this has existed. It's about remembering, it's about keeping it alive. Um, so I think that's the, the most challenging part. This is Tara Seed. I have a quick question. Thank you for your presentation, all of them actually. Um, I'm curious about the, the goal of maybe scaling across bioregions. So I think I heard this week that the smoke from our fires has reached the East Coast. And I'm curious how you envision collaborating across bioregions when, for example, climate change and other things we have to work on our planetary and scale. Um, well, I'll say a word, but I want to hold space for other presenters, if uh, Judy and Neha want to share. Um, so, right, this is probably, you know, this is like going to be a couple years down the road before we get there, right? Maybe we'll never get there. But what you're identifying is exactly right. Like the smoke from our fires goes everywhere. Um, a teacher once illuminated me on the fact that um, the rain in the Amazon and the, the flying rivers of the Amazon, that water floats up to California and is where our limited rainfall comes from. So as trees are cut in the Amazon, California gets drier. And so it really, we are so connected across bioregions. Each bioregion is a stakeholder in the health of every other bioregion. And yeah, we've never been able to collaborate as humans at that scale. Um, but we have to learn how to try. And so what we're doing is a crazy experiment and trying to figure that out. Yeah. I don't know. And I think we'll just try to keep learning as we go and see what works. And the more coherent we can be as the people of one landscape, our theory is that the more coherent we might be able to be across multiple landscapes. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I have a question. Please go ahead. Hi, hi, Carrie. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, your presentation that really inspired. And, and um, as Sam said, as he was checking out a deep bow for uh, Judy and um, Claire and Mila, just the work that you've done and that you're that you're catalyzing. I'm, I'm really heartened. Um, and I say that because, as we know, it's just such a depressing time. Um, one one question I had is: Are you uh, have you had any contact with um, people in Extinction Rebellion uh, or the Deep Adaptation Movement, for instance, who um, I think could really benefit from Hilo and uh, from I don't know, at some point, um, I could see real synergy uh, between the Terran Collective and uh, what they are up to. I don't, yeah, Nay, do you, I don't think we've been in touch with them. No, not uh, actively. I am a part of a lot of the XR stuff that happens in the Bay, but I will say honestly that we received um, the gift of the code base in March. And so it has been very fast moving. And it's similar to the question of how do we want to do mutual aid for COVID? Uh, and 
how much of this is, is rushing to do something um, and how much of it is understanding the organic organizing that is happening right now and learning from that. And I would say we're in the latter stage, though it's an incredible idea and would be honored to, you know, use this for organizing. Um, so thank you for planting that seed. I have a question for Judy. Judy, I wonder what um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced in the work of doing more grassroots organizing? And um, yeah, just your reflections and thoughts on that. Judy, you're on mute, by the way. Um, well, the, the biggest challenge right now is organizing all the materials I have. Um, it's grass, right, grassroots organizing is, I don't find problematic, but I find problematic just because I have so much stuff right now. Planetrum is uh, in the process of uh, reorganizing our website to make it more available as resources for people and it's uh, there's just an incredible amount of, of material and essays and publications and things that um, that I'm dealing with but um, I I wanted to um, ask Claire and Nia if um, if they've been in contact with the people that are already doing some of the things that they envision uh, working with, like there's a group in Berkeley that does um, uh, the um, footprint, green, uh, analyzing the footprints for various places and how they're uh, utilizing, utilizing things. So I wondered, if you've been in contact with the various people that are doing these things, I don't know. And I wondered also about the maps that you're thinking about making. Will they have overlays so that you can um, pull up information in various ways? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nay, you want to go first? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll respond to the, um, the mapping question. We have so many dreams for the maps um, and really view maps as a method of storytelling. And so our dream is to be able to have the watershed and in our view, bioregions are um, the boundaries that the land itself naturally expresses. So how can we use that this as an opportunity and educational moment. And we've toyed with ideas like completely removing the text, like things like Berkeley or Oakland, so that we can relate in the way like you were just showing this, this the urban map of San Francisco and the natural landscape. How can we start to strengthen our ability to relate to the one that you had on the left? Um, there are different layers that we're exploring, um, like mapping the original peoples, um, and things like that, but we're trying to essentially decolonize maps. Um, and then to the other point, there are so many organizations that are doing incredible work and we hope this can exist to amplify their work. And every single day we are learning of new uh, organizations as well. So I think we don't know what we don't know. And um, if anyone has any ideas of who we might um, engage with, please do let us know. Um, yeah. And I'd, be, I'd also, Judy, love to hear what map layers you think would be most exciting. Yes. Um, I mean, I also have just so many questions for you, but I won't, I won't use this time. Claire, what do you think? Uh, I agree. I want to hear what Judy thinks we should put on the map. Have you seen the map of Cascadia that David McCloskey made? No? Yes. 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 Yeah. Well, what it doesn't have, it doesn't have people in it. 
it's a, it's an incredible map and he's making other maps right now that have different points of view there i couldn't give you um i couldn't give you a list of things to include on the map i i wonder if you have all the historical things do you have historical things on your map because that's Besides being indigenous people, you also would want to have the histories of places and the things that happened at places. And there are lots of those. There are lots of tours going on with things like that. Let's, um, let's move to Danielle. She's been waiting patiently with her hand up. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for taking my question and thanks for bringing us all high low and for this awesome presentation uh, and the storytelling that you guys have already done. Um, I am from Seattle and we have just launched our uh, very small community which we hope to grow on high low today and we're super excited about it. So this is about circular economy. Um, and so love the map piece of it and when you talked about, for example, creating a map of native grasses. Um, has anybody used the maps to sort of highlight, say, excess fruit? It's kind of like harvest season now and everybody's trying to get rid of extra garden things before they go to waste. Is anybody using it for something like this at this point? I'd be curious just to hear how that's sprung up because that might be something that we could try to launch uh, in our little community as well. Um, yeah, that actually someone used it for exactly that. Um, before we even had a map feature, someone in our community posted about like all their plum trees were fruiting at once. They could not yeah. at the time. Um, people, please come take the abundance. Um, and that is exactly how we imagine this, right? Like you have abundance, you can share it with people in your community that can benefit from it. Um, yeah, so exactly that. That's fantastic. That's my easy question. My set, so that's great to know because now I can feel like it's not a crazy idea. Um, and then the second question I have is when you were talking about uh, in the last couple slides, the topic of carrying capacity of a bioregion, um, it seems that we're all pretty much consuming and reaching beyond the carrying capacity of a lot of our bioregions. And so I'm curious when you mentioned like what kind of actions could, could be taken uh, to sort of mitigate that short of obviously things along the lines of you know what the zero population growth group had been trying to do 50 years ago <laughs> um you know something that's more um regenerative and more resource sharing more efficient more lean uh if you will i'm just curious where your guys discussions have gone on that because it's a can be a touchy topic yeah we can't we definitely can't just like move people around um, <laughs> If I were uh, a bioregion that, uh, the, you know, if I were a bioregional community and I wanted to look at that, I would start by looking at um, the really amazing data that is being generated by the Economic Democracy Advocates. Um, they are a really great group that studies this exact thing. And they issued a, an amazing report about the Bay Area a year ago. Um, and it looks at all of the counties around the Bay and it looks at how much water they produce and how much water they consume and how much food they produce and food they consume. And it's definitely not, um, yeah, most of, the, most of the Bay Area is definitely way over their carrying capacity, um, but there are places that are not. Um, so like, up the Sacramento, we get areas that are um, actually producing more than they're consuming when it comes to water and when it comes to food. Um, like, I guess out towards, yeah, out towards Sacramento, um, into the more agricultural areas up in Sonoma. And that's really interesting. Um, and the counties that are not um, providing for their own needs can then really analyze what they're what they're doing and just I think we just need to try to be producing more local food is a really huge one like we can't have these like global systems because they're not going to last very long um, if if San Francisco is getting most of their food from Sonoma that would actually be great but most of our food is not coming from Sonoma it's coming from S South America or something um, 
and at least being able to move the resources around a bioregion more efficiently would be a huge improvement. Um, yeah, so that's, that's just one way to start the analysis. Thank you for the resource and the ideas. That's really appreciated. Thanks. All right, did, did anybody else have their hand up that I may have missed? Abir, did you have a question? Somebody mentioned your name. Yeah, I'd be, I'd love Matt Switzer's question about if anybody has any ideas sparked from this conversation about things they'd like to do. So I, Matt's question is great. And, and, and that was really, you know, I was inspired by Judy when I, when I first met her and worked with her and, you know, now I'm inspired by you all, Claire and Miha and, and Tara and um, Carrie's vision that, that she's been advocating. Um, and, you know, there's just uh, so many, so many different uh, leaders, right? Professors and students and technologists and bioregionalists and lawyers and, um, it's just you know sustainable business leaders here so i'm i'm curious kind of your you know um moving forward on your on your vision and, and thinking about you know what can we do with these storytellers what can we do with these people? um where do we go from here uh, <laughs> Thanks. You're unmuted, Jim. Anyway, so those are my questions. I actually missed your question because of the background noise. <laughs> no, it, it was, it, you know, there's a lot of people uh, here. Um, I'm curious uh, if you have a, um, a thought of where we could go. Uh, you know, I know. Um, uh, well, there could there could be future events, right? So I'm curious what you think would be um, nice to see moving forward. Okay, and and that, uh, or or uh, impact could could facilitate that, or uh, or these people could facilitate that. I feel inspired also to just you know jump in for a moment. So you know, thanks everybody for such a great event. I think the the combination of what Judy was presenting and what Claire and um, and Neha were presenting was such an awesome juxtaposition of two different ways of approaching bioregionalism. Uh, you know, one question that comes up in my mind, and I know the nonprofit approach is really important. Capitalism and technology is such a complex, so how do we break that open? But one book that really inspired me was called White Man's Burden, about the importance of asking people who otherwise would be charity, you know, cases to pay for products or services especially in developing economies. So this book was, came out in like 2011, for example. And so I, I just, the question comes up, you know, that is there value to asking people to pay for a service like Hilo? I, I think I didn't fully understand uh, if it was purely research and there was no plan to ever get anybody to pay for it or if that's part of the plan at some point in time. So I was just wondering whether there is a virtue of asking people to pay for it as a way to force, uh, you know, your 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 design to to take into account, you know, stakeholders. I'm 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 just opening up that question of asking people to pay for something being techno capitalist, but also a way for participation to occur on on material terms. Yeah, I know we're at time, but I'll, I'm happy to answer that real quick. Um, yeah, I didn't go too much into our business model, um, but our plan is to be completely gift-based for perpetuity. Um, we, we are really seeing this as a commons, and we do not want Hilo to be captured by capitalism and by the coercive and corrosive power of the market. Um, this is the position that we hold, um, and there are certainly merits to what you're saying, absolutely. Um, but what we on our team have found and have lived in our experience is that even with the best of intentions, um, working inside the capitalist system makes it very easy for your work to be um, co-opted by the forces that are profit seeking. Um, and uh, I can, yeah, I can definitely see 
there being like the, the importance of reciprocity though I hear in what you're saying and uh, we will definitely ask for gifts from people using Hilo. We will ask for donations and people that are benefiting from the platform are certainly free to give them, uh, but we really want them to be free to give it and, uh, and not, be, not be a requirement to using the platform because we really want it to be a gift that is accessible by all. Thank you everyone and thank you to all the presenters. This was uh, amazing. I really enjoyed the conversation with all of you and um, look forward to many more. I think um, there might be some resources that we can share via email afterwards. And so um, if I don't end up, because this email link got forwarded to many different people and so um, if you don't get this resource doc that we'll send out afterwards, you can email me at carrie.crisp, which is K-A-R-I-E, dot c-r-i-s-p at gmail.com and i will send it to you um, so thank you everybody and um, thanks again to our presenters and have a great evening awesome and i'm just going to invite everybody to do one last howl just because i had a good time so feel <laughs> free <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> 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 Uh, Carrie and uh, our guests one last round of applause. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you all for um, the first PCC forum and uh, I believe the first uh, impact at CIS as well. Um, hopefully a uh, strong start to a strong semester. Yeah. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you for, for oh, setting this up. It's been very informative. Have a great night so much, Judy, for sharing your wisdom. Thank you all for organizing. Um, we look forward to coordinating at the scale of the bioregion soon. Thank you.